to you all from here at the Poets Lighthouse. I thank you for joining us every Saturday. I'm your host, Finn Bell, always very humbled to have the opportunity to sit down with our fabulous poet guests. Today's Poet Lighthouse, Susan Brown, hails from Chico, California. She is the recipient of a fellowship from Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, and her work has been nominated for three Pushcart Awards. She has also received awards from Four Way Books, the Los Angeles Poetry Festival, the River Sticks International Poetry Contest, and the Fisher Poetry Prize. Susan has published three books of poetry, Buddha's Dogs, Zephyr, and Just Living, this last collection, a recent winner of the Catamaran Poetry Prize. Her poetry has appeared in journals such as Plowshare, Poetry, The Sun, and 180 more extraordinary poems for everyday life. Let's welcome poet Susan Brown into our studio. Good afternoon, Susan. Hi, Finn. Hi there. Nice to see you. It is so wonderful to have you here and sit down with you finally. Yeah, it's great. So the first time, Susan, that I had the pleasure to hear you share your poetry was a few months back, and this was online at the Beatnik Cafe. And you shared your poem, I believe. Um, it was called Still Doing It. And I was hooked from that moment. I have to admit that in my own experience, my creativity peaks. My art and my sensuality have a very softly blurred line. And all of three of these elements feed into one another. Do you relate with this too? When um, you find in your own experience that how your creativity peaks and comes together, that your art, sensuality, and um, your creativity have sort of blurred lines and that they feed one another. Um, do you relate with this too? Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think art uh, is a visceral, it's a, it's a body, it's a, it's something in your, in your, in your whole being, you know, mm. that, that happens for you. And that, that's why it's not just intellectual. It's, it's very much part of all of your uh, feelings and, and senses. And uh, to me, poetry is very much like singing. Um, I sing too, and I play the guitar and mm -hmm. I have always done that uh, from, for a lot of my life. And I, just um, it's just a whole life experience of being in the world. I mean, I would say that I started writing poetry when I was very young, mm -hmm. and it just came naturally to me. And mm -hmm. it really didn't have anything to do with school, or it was just uh, a neighbor gave me a book of poetry, and I was about eleven years old, and I just went. That's that's it for me. I, I love it. Besides singing and dancing, <laughs> Bonneville. Yeah, I just love it. That um, I see that as completely going with each other. Just um, this this marriage or this friendship amongst all the uh, the arts or different outlets of creativity. Um, so, speaking of you know music, you said that you you sing. Um, I know that you had collaborated to create a word slash music recording. Um, so music does figure in how you perceive poetry in spoken form. Does music also influence and direct the mood of pieces for you as you go through your creative process? Um, yeah, the, the sounds of, of words together, um, the, 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 the sonic element of, mm. Of, of, of words are something I just am really attracted to. And even when, just when people are speaking, there's there's poetry coming out of human beings all the time. Yes. Uh, the, way, the way we speak to each other and, you know, the things we say and uh, yeah. So the, I'll be writing something and I, I won't be really listening to the music of it. But then when I go to look back later, there it is. You know, I can see that the words are chiming with each other. And if, and if I do just a little bit more, mm -hmm. uh, there'll be more of that. So, you know, I can do that in revision. Uh, but 
You know, it's a feeling in the body. You know, it's a it's again getting back to the sensual. It's really a feeling of of the rhythm and mm -hmm. and the line and the music in the line that when I'm composing, I it, it just feels so good. And then mm -hmm. and then afterwards, right? I can look at it and go, oh no, that's not good at all. That's completely yeah. corny and that's ridiculous. And <laughs> you know, start start over. But um, uh, it's a trance. It's kind of a beautiful trance to get in writing for me uh, when, yes. when it's going well. And that doesn't mean that it's, that the poem or the or the short story or whatever I'm writing is going to come out, you know, well. But because it needs a lot of work. But I think the the uh, the impulse to do this and sit down for hours and and do this with nobody, you know, you're by yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You're in a room with four walls and no one else. Uh, what What's the attraction there? And the, the, the attraction is the conversation with the, the self, with the soul, but also with the world, you know, because you are, you are writing for the, I am, I am writing to, to communicate with other people. And so it's a conversation with myself, but it's also, a conversation like singing. I mean, I can bring back the singing again. Uh, you know, when a when a singer is standing up there on the stage, they're they're singing out of their body, but they're singing. You know, they're singing for others, mm -hmm. and I've always wanted it to be for mm -hmm. others, even though it takes a lot of work for it to be for others. Is is what I found. You know, I mean, not every no one cares about your life unfortunately i mean i mean i mean they they, they do they do but uh, it, it, yeah, you, your friends and your family care about your life but but i mean if you want to reach out to a whole lot of other people you've got to find something in the pitch and in the and in the voice um on a piece of paper that's going to bring you an audience i mean the singer can do it with other elements but mm -hmm. the but the poet, the writer, has has only language. Yeah, doesn't have, doesn't have the beautiful violin and the guitar and the and the and the harmony. Yeah. But the uh, the 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 words and the voice itself can be the the beautiful instrument that you mm -hmm. use. But you know, I, I just love how you explained so perfectly how what I try to explain to other people who are not enamored of poetry and the poetry life uh, of how you are um, contained within yourself. You're doing this as a solitary pursuit, but you're also trying to reach out um, with your poetry and what you do and your art um, to other people. So it, it has those that, you know, that, that kind of um, double, double life, I guess, <laughs> going on for sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for that. We now go on a short break, folks, but when we return, we will return with more interesting conversation with our guest. <laughs> I am so happy for us to return with our lovely guest, poet Susan Brown. Today, our poet guest has not only one, but two gorgeous poems to share with us. Susan, can you tell us a tiny bit about each one? And then please honor us with your reading. <laughs> ben, that's so sweet. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll start with the poem, uh, uh, Dare. Uh, what can I say about this poem? Um, that's not already in it. Uh, let me see. Well, I, I would say that I, I I like this. I chose, you know, I could have, I could have chosen a lot of different poems to read if out of poems I've written, but I chose this one because um, I I just really like it, and I felt that it's um. Uh, like, like all my poems, until I don't. But I just feel like this one is about 
my entire life, uh, not my entire life, but a lot of a, of a, of a life, a woman's life, uh, particularly, uh, in a poem, and a, a woman particularly of my uh, generation. And, but I feel like it kind of, it, it goes over the generational border too. So I guess I'm speaking, I'm speaking from myself and I'm speaking for a, for a lot of women, but also a, a woman uh, like me who lived a long time alone. And um, so should I, I guess I should read it now? Yes, please. Thank All you. right. <laughs> and then, and I, the title is Dare. And I, you know, when I was a kid, I don't know if they still do this, but you know, I dare you. I, I dare you to do that. Um, it was, it was a big thing for us. And um, so I double dare you. So this is called Dare. Desolate and determined. Spent your twenties marrying and divorcing. Trying to be what? It was hopeless. Every spring, another busted heart. Oh, more yes than Molly Bloom could imagine. You wanted to experiment. A woman's life sucked. Why shouldn't you? Like it knew, like it nude with your boots on, in the snow, on the swing, in the hot middle of a night. Don't forget the museum and the pumpkin patch of screaming crows on the ping pong table. After you beat him, you beat him good, and why shouldn't you? You were just as good or better. You were better. The letter said he'd never speak your name again. How dare you? Decline marriage number three. You had steel inside, he said. You thought a little steel was fine. Living alone when women didn't. How dare you live alone? How many times did you hear, do you have children? A woman not having children or dreaming of curtains, couches, crock pots. What a shame. The magic in being without someone's idea of you. A kind of splendor traveling through loneliness, its temples and alleys, like rising at dawn each morning to run silent streets, the loyal sound of one breath after another and coming home glittered with sweat or rain, letting faith begin the days, if not in them, candles lit, flowers in a vase, a simple warm meal, always a song, crying for all the reasons. Oh, just that imagery there. Oh, goodness, yes. So, um, apologies in advance because this is going to be a very um, kind of loaded and long question, <laughs> a little bit more involved. But um, in that poem, in Dare, you begin with the lines that immediately pull the listener or the reader in. Desolate and determined, spent your 20s marrying and divorcing, and then later on you say, you had steel inside, he said, you thought a little steel was fine, living alone when women didn't, how dare you live alone? You know, I just sucked that in and I let out this exasperated breath when I read that first. Um, because on, on behalf of the story and on behalf of, of other women, all women, because we're heaped upon with lofty expectations, but we're still expected to know our place. Did you feel you gifted yourself with that much more freedom? to be you, to be unapologetic with this poem? And did you feel that it will imbue other women with similar power? Well, yes, I am, um, I am completely unapologetic about my life and the way that I have lived it. And I feel that um, I'm, a, I'm a hero in my own life. And I, I feel like so many women are heroes and um, 
they're, they're the heroes that raise humanity, um, mm. basically. And they, and, and so do men. But I mean, they, they, in my generation, it was, it was mostly always women. Yes. Uh, thank God, you know, men have joined the, you know, that process, and it's so beautiful. But no, I'm not, I'm not a, apologetic at all about living my life uh, for a long time by myself. Uh, Galway Canal has a, you know, a fantastic, incredible poem about. Uh, it's titled "When One Has Lived." One, when one has lived a long time alone. And I lived 14 years of my life by myself in my adult life. And as a woman, you know, during that time, you know, women didn't do that. And anyway, when I heard, when I heard Galway's poem, I just, I just sat there weeping, you know, I mean, first of all, it's the most gorgeous, such an incredibly astoundingly gorgeous poem in every way possible. But, um, you know, so he was speaking for the universe, I mean, universal something in people, you know, men and women and all people who live a long time alone and find out what that's about, find out what yes. that's like. You know, in other words, I personally don't think people spend enough time alone. You know, I think that that we should teach people, you know, to be able to be alone in a very creative and beautiful way so that. You know, I found in living alone, I found out more about how to be a better human being. Um, mm -hmm. I, I necessarily did. I not did not necessarily learn how to do that among people. I feel like I people teach you other things, but I felt like I really learned how to um, live a very creative life of not of, of, of taking on tremendous personal responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, by living by myself for so long. So that when I finally did get an, into a relationship, a long-term relationship with my husband, who I've been with for 28 years, um, it, it, it was so beautiful because there was a lot of things that, you know, we didn't have to teach each other. He had also mm -hmm. lived a while, quite a long time by himself. And, you know, it's really about becoming more of a person who can love a, another mm -hmm. person and not, you know, expect so much uh, from other people. Yeah. So no, I'm not apologetic at all about the way I live my life, but I found, you know, I found there's anger in that poem too, you know, dare, you know, yes. uh, like in other words, it's like why in the hell, you know, can't we all just live the way we want to live? Uh, whether you're a woman or a man or you're gay, or you're straight or you're trans or you're black or you're white or you're yellow or you're purple or, you know, in other words, we should be able to live our life the way we want to live our life and be totally honored for that in every regard. And so, you know, um, I felt like as a woman, I was not respected. I was mm -hmm. not honored, you know, by being someone who had chosen to not have children and to not uh, live in that kind of domestic mm -hmm. uh, environment, you know, which did not call to me when I was a young woman. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what called to me was was uh, getting a career and, and doing something for the world and, you know, being being in the world in a way that um, was not just having children. And, you know, having children is, a, is an amazing job. It's, mm -hmm. an, it's an incredible job. But it's like there should also be a lot of respect for women who are the ones who went ahead and did not do that. And they paved the road for other women to, yeah. you know, make that choice. Yeah. yeah. But I, you know, so there is a little, yeah, there's fire <laughs> in me still about that because, you know, the, the culture is still so ridiculously. It really is. Yeah. But it makes me vomit, you know, really. And so it's some, it's, it's a, it's something in my writing and in my themes of my writing that will always be there. Uh, because women still are not, you know, we're not mm -hmm. honored enough, yeah. and it, we are it, not honored. We are not honored in all the ways that we can be honored. Yeah. Meaning, you know, not so as true. someone's wife and someone's mother. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I know. I, it's, I just find it's like uh, an invasive plant. It creeps in even in this time and day and age. You would think that perceptions would change. And it, it is slowly happening. But every once in a while, um, when these 
archaic ways of thinking about what women should or should not be creep in. It's it still ast it astounds me seriously, Susan. So um, I am. Um, I am happy that that fire was there. I felt the fire when you were sharing that poem. It was so satisfying, seriously. <laughs> well, it's, yeah, yeah, it's definitely of the body, I'll tell you. For sure. I mean, I had a boyfriend once who said, yeah, you have a good left hook. You know? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't actually hit him, but you know, not that that would be a good thing for a woman to, to decide to do, but. Uh, uh, I, I know I'm too old for this, but please adopt me, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was that was after I went to visit him, and we were having a big problem. And I, I was all fired up because I just seen the movie uh, Thelma and Louise. Yeah, I see. Yeah, one of the greatest movies ever. Uh, uh, yes, I was late on that bandwagon. I didn't watch it at the first showing. I only watched it maybe within the last ten years. And yes, oh my God. I was missing out. <laughs> Okay, Susan, um, I believe you have your second poem to share with us, and I'm excited, yes. so excited yeah. about it, so excited. Yeah. And this is, this is completely in a different, you know, realm. Uh, I, I don't write a lot of poems that are uh, uh, based on paintings, uh, mm -hmm. but I, uh, I don't know, I, this one, I was in Italy, I was fortunate fortunate enough to know, to go to Italy uh, one mm -hmm. summer. And uh, this was a painting that I saw by Caravaggio in the uh, Borghese Museum in Rome. And I, I, I had seen Caravaggio's paintings before, mm -hmm. but I'd never seen them, you know, in real life. Yes. And I was just astounded uh, by his work. And of course he does the chiaroscuro, he does the black, chiaroscuro is an Italian word for the black and white that he, the dark and the light that he mm -hmm. does in his paintings that are, that's so astounding. And people hadn't apparently done that uh, before him or as, as well as he did. And I was just so drawn by that darkness and that lightness and in, in, in the way he handled it in, a, in mm -hmm. a painting. And then I was raised Catholic. So uh, this painting was of the uh, Madonna and, mm -hmm. uh, G and the child Jesus and, uh, uh, Mar and Mar Mary's mother. Uh, so I, and then there was a snake in it. I went, okay, we, we're just loading up this painting unbelievably. <laughs> We got the mom and the grandma and we got Jesus and the snake. And <laughs> I went uh, that uh, with my Catholic upbringing and my interest in, you know, all things spiritual, that is just the most magnificent thing I've ever seen. Uh, and so I just kept staring at it and staring at it. And then uh, we were going home in a taxi and uh, the news came on mm -hmm. about the the uh, terrible massacre at the uh, I think I think the in Florida I think mm -hmm. the nightclub was called the Pulse Pulse yeah 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 and so the, I think it was in it was in 2016 and so I was just devastated by that news and um, so anyway that's where this poem mm -hmm. came from. and then also I was staying in this most gorgeous place um, mm -hmm. in in Italy. Uh, called La Romita, a uh, very beautiful place in Tyranny, Italy. Chiaroscuro. The Italian birds fly over the garden, where this morning I stood on sunstruck tiles next to an olive orchard, thinking how fortunate to land here, eating the earth, drinking the vineyard, traveling to Rome, to a room of Caravaggio's that nearly stopped me from breathing, especially the painting where Mary, her skin incandescent, leans out of the gloom to help her young son try to crush the snake's head, his little luminous foot on top of his mother's, the details eerie and real as if I could touch each figure and feel the plush of flesh as if the serpent could uncoil and slither out of the frame. Later in the taxi, the driver tells me about the shooting, a nightclub in Florida, and then I'm back in the garden, mumbling a prayer, although it's only us 
who can save us as I watch the birds cross the sky, sweeping the light into their dark wings. Yes. I loved both poems, but that was just, that touched me so deeply because I am a Caravaggio fan as well. Um, so in this poem, Chiaroscuro, you contemplate on Caravaggio's Madonna and Child with Saint Anne, on its eerie atmosphere created by light and dark, and how the master makes the divine earthy and tactile. In the poem later, you learn the news of the nightclub shooting in Florida. In this setting that like Caravaggio, is it at once, this is at once spiritual and corporeal. How did it affect your receiving of that devastating news? Um, yeah, yeah, it just, well, first of all, is we were in the most, well, Rome to me, well, Rome has a lot of grittiness too, of course, that, that's yeah. part of its beauty. Uh, but, you know, Italy was so powerful to me overall. I didn't mm -hmm. see a lot of it, Italy. I saw, I was in Umbria. Uh, it, it was enough, I'll tell you. I mean, I like to go back, of course, and see more. Mm -hmm. But it's so gorgeous of a place. And, and everything is just so beautiful. And then we were staying at this, this even more gorgeous retreat. We were doing a writing workshop there. And the food, you know, the wine, the 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 summer, the mm. the, the, the little cisterns and the, the little blue violets everywhere. I mean, we were just in such a gorgeous environment. And then, you know, then suddenly you hear about this massacre yeah. and people killing just a person, you know, killing so many people. And, you know, the, the contrast of that uh, was horrifying and mm -hmm just how you can be in this beauty and then there's just so much ugliness in our world. And um, those, and like I said, you know, it's only us who can save us. Um, yeah. You know, this, 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 and, and so, you know, I'm trying to get in that. Uh, I have a very deep um, Catholic upbringing mm -hmm. uh, that I honor, uh, but I also, you know, moved away from it uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, we need to take care of this world um, and, and figure out what's going on in this world and not, you know, not place all of our bets on the next uh, because we're, you know, we're not doing so well here. So it just, it just um, was astonishing to me. And that's that, 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 that contrast. Um, yes. Because of where I was too. Um, I mean, I, I, I was in, I, I live in Chico now, but I lived in Oakland for, for a very long time, mm -hmm. Oakland, California. And there's a lot of, you know, a lot of difficulty in, in Oakland. Yes. And uh, not to say that there isn't in Chico, there's difficulty everywhere, but uh, just, um, yeah, the contrast of being in Italy in that particularly beautiful place and, and then being in this incredible museum all day in this drenched mm -hmm. beauty. Um, yeah, and then that, but the and then chiaroscuro, you know, it's the whole, it's that's what it is all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's funny that you brought up Oakland, because <laughs> I also see, you know, that sense of kind of disparity of you know the, the light and the dark too, because I live, you know, not fifteen minutes away from Oakland, right. and you can be just driving down, and you're going through the toughest, the worst parts. And then you all of a sudden are in a upper middle class, beautiful neighborhood all within Oakland. And so, you know, just the, the, the violence is not far removed from, you know, people think that they're immune to it. It's, it's all our world. We need to definitely change things it's not just certain segments and certain segments and we're separated there's none of that separation anymore it's it's so apparent um thank you for that susan um oh you know i wanted to ask you <laughs> since you are leading a workshop very soon uh within this month with the uh catamaran writing conference can you 
tell us a little bit more about this because I just imagine it as this ideal situation, a writer's dream where you're relaxing and creating by the seaside. Can you tell us a little bit more? Uh, this will be my first time to teach mm -hmm. there. So, um, you know, I, I, I don't know a lot about what it's, what it's going to be like, but I, but I know it's going to be beautiful because it's by the sea. It's right there in Santa Cruz. And uh, um, I'm doing a four day workshop there uh, mm -hmm. with Joseph Millar. He's also teaching there too, which is, mm -hmm. he's another wonderful poet. Um, that, and, he, and then fiction writers is going to, oh. so it's fiction writers. It's not, uh, Jane Smiley will be there uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, novel writing. And then there's, uh, sure, yeah, there's, there's some, there's quite a few people that are there. Um, and so it's going to be a very vibrant conference of uh, poetry, uh, fiction, nonfiction, and uh, craft talks. And so uh, the workshops that I'm teaching, and mo most of the workshops, I think all the workshops will be from like 9:30 to 12:30. And there's a minimum, I think there's the, 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 the class is full at 12. So I have a few spaces left and it's, so it's three hours every day, three or three or three and a half hours every day in the morning of workshopping. And then there's craft talks and breakfast, lunch and dinner and by the sea and going for walks. And in the evening we do readings and um, I, I think it's just gonna be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds so gorgeous. So, I, I'm looking forward to it. We were supposed to do it last year, but of course we could not do it last year. Yes. And um, so it's, I, and this will be my first time that I've been able to teach people in the flesh, in, in, in the room together with each other. And I just can't wait for that so to be with exciting. other people. So yeah. you're, you're making me want to <laughs> <laughs> sign up belatedly. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so we are coming, we have come to the end of our interview. And I want to pose one last question to you, our dear guest, um, before we must sadly part ways. So Susan, in your daily practice of writing your poetry, what are three vital elements that your creativity craves to ignite that spark anew every day? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, I love things in threes. Um, let me see. Well, every morning, yeah, because um, I, I mostly write in the morning. But now, I've, as I've gotten older, I've been able to write at, at a lot of different times. Not in the mm -hmm. evening, really. But um, let me see. Well, I have to have my room, uh, my office. I have to have a light. I have to have the light coming in through the window and mm -hmm. just be in, a, be in a place. Like I just moved. So, you know, get, I lived in my other house for 22 years. So mm -hmm. uh, to, get my, to get my office together and make it okay uh, was really important. So I have this beautiful room uh, with a lot of light and um, I'm in it right now and it has my you know has my my bookcases are over here uh. and, uh, <laughs> I got the and my music and, uh. and so you know I just have to have this I, you gotta have a space it, it can be very you small do. but you gotta have this space that's your own a room of one's own <laughs> You gotta have you go. Virginia was right. I mean, you, you gotta have it, and I have it, and um, so I have that. And then the second thing for inspiration is always reading. You know, I read poet, mm. uh, other poets, and um, you know, I will sometimes I like set myself up for it. Mm -hmm. uh, like I say, I want like. Um, uh, you know, I'll just be on a certain kick. Like right now, I'm on a. Where, where's this book? Oh, I'm a third away somewhere. But anyway, Adam Zagajewski. I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but um, Adam Zagajewski. You know, I I love his poetry so much. I've read all of his poetry, but right now I need to read it again for some reason. And so I have him there, and I start reading him. 
Uh, or sometimes I just go online and I know of a certain journal. Uh, Catamaran is a great journal to read from. Um, you know, or I'll have their journal right in front of me. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not online, but um, New Ohio Review. I love, mm -hmm. I love their stuff online. Um, uh, you know, I'll just, there's so many places online and I will just be reading. And then all of a sudden I got to, I got to write. Uh, so reading is really important. And then what would be the third thing that inspires me? Um, sometimes I do listen to music. Um, mm -hmm. so, sometimes I uh, will put on, um, you know, a song that I mm -hmm. Uh, like Patty Griffin, I just I just learned her song on the guitar. It's called uh, Heavenly Day, and I and if I get into a song like that uh, that I love that really touches me and makes me mm -hmm. feel a lot, um, I, I will kind of explore that. Like I'll listen to it for quite a, you know many times over, and then all of a sudden I'll go, "What's going on?" I'll turn them. I can't write with the music on. I do not write with music on because that conflicts with my own music, uh, but. I, you know, I would just go, what's going on with that song? And, um, and I used to always, that, why is it moving me so much? I mean, the words are one thing, but, you know, what's, what's really underneath all that? And then, so, yeah, um, those are the three things that, that, that I have to have every day. I have to have, I sing every day, pretty much, either in the car or with my guitar or in the shower. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to have something that's, that's moving me. Um, I want something that makes me feel. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm in this dead zone or I'm just for some reason not feeling much, uh, then I will put on music because I know that I and I know the music that will get me. So right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna like shake this thing up. You're like, oh, the other. And then this is the fourth thing. I have to have exercise. You know. Okay. Yeah. Like sometimes I get up at 630 in the morning or 615 in the morning and I'll go for a walk for like an hour or an hour and a half. And 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 I, where I live now, there's just beautiful places. Well, there's beautiful places in Oakland to walk to, but um, I'll just go walk. And um, I think Mary Oliver talked about this a lot, but um, yes. it really works for me. Like I'll, I'll even bring a little thing in my pocket to write on, but now we have our phones, so I can just put it on my voice memo thing. And I'll just start walking. And I need to walk for like an hour or an hour and a half. I can't just do like a half an hour. Um, and then things occur to me, you know, or I, or I start working on a poem that I think sucks, you know, a poem that I think is really bad. <laughs> and I go, this is not working, but I like these first three lines. And and then maybe something else will come to me while I'm while I'm walking. Yeah. So those You made the me so happy with that that answer, Susan, because um, I don't do it anymore, but the activity I do prior to um, my writing practice is I used to dance. I yeah. definitely listen to music. I probably don't sing as well as you, but I will precursor <laughs> my writing sessions. It's really weird. I'm only my dogs and my cats hear me. I'm singing off key, but it just makes me happy. And it, yes. it leads me into what my practice will be that day. And you mentioned Mary Oliver. That is my poet this month who I am contemplating every day. It's, it's actually going back to her, her dog songs. Um, so um, just kind of talking about life and death and renewal and the lessons. So I just, that's where I am right now. So thank you so much for that, Susan. Yeah, that's great connection, yeah. <laughs> I know, it's wonderful. Yeah. See, I, uh, we, we definitely do connect and we have similar things that we do as poets so I don't I don't feel so strange and alone <laughs> no 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 you're not alone <laughs> oh my goodness this was amazing um thank so, you, this is really <laughs> lovely. Thank you. so to our sojourners uh, if you would like to learn more about our guest Susan Brown please go to her website which is www.susanbrownpoems.com all one word 
where you can find out about her books, her poetry, and workshops. Also, don't forget to check out her upcoming poetry workshop, which she'll be teaching at the Catamaran Writing Conference in Santa Cruz, California, this July 25th to the 29th by going to https colon double forward slash catamaran literary reader dot com forward slash writing dash conference dash 2021. Woo, that was a lot. <laughs> You can also follow Susan on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash S Brown. That's Brown with an E at the end, DVC forward slash. Thank you for tuning in to the Poets Lighthouse. Please support all PGN programming by subscribing to the Poetry Global Network and liking, sharing, and commenting on our videos on YouTube. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.